Thank you so much for coming, especially because there's a Zelda talk next door. So if you're here, I feel very honored. Um, I'm sure you're all going to watch it on the wall. Uh, let's talk about marketing money. OK, let's dive right in. Today's talk is about how to budget your indie games promotion campaign. Um, and the main reason why I'm giving this talk is because it's one of the most asked questions when I talk to indie devs to self-publish for the first time. They talk to publishers, they want to understand budgeting, and also people that just make their first commercial game. Um, to be honest, when I started writing this talk, I pretty quickly figured out why there isn't that much online resources about that specific topic. Um, in my research, I found a picture that pretty much like summed up what it feels like trying to make a talk about indie games marketing budgeting, and not to be dramatic, but it's quite similar to that. Because really, when you ask, what is a good marketing budget, you might as well ask, how long is a piece of string? It's a question that's super hard to answer, and it wasn't easy to you know, give like a default cookie cutter solution. So I hope in this talk, I can give you a guideline that you can follow, but all I would say, like, take it with a grain of salt, those things really depend on the game. Um, before we dive in further, just a reminder to please fill out the evaluations after, and also please turn off your phones. OK, the second reason why giving a talk about a budgeting isn't that easy is money is weird. And you probably, you probably know those things, but I do want to like highlight them again. Um, money really depends. It's usually different. It gets you different far depending where you are. Like if you talk about the salary in the Bay Area compared to like a remote island, it's super different. Um, especially in Indy, you're going to wear a lot of hats. You, there's people that can do their own TikToks. They can do their own press outreach. You maybe have to pay for that if that's not your cup of tea. So there's like a huge spectrum of like budgets that can result from that. Also, money changes, you know, pre-pandemic, inflation goes up, all that kind of stuff. Probably by the time this talk is over, the numbers are outdated. So like, you know, I want to give you a rough like guideline, but those things will change over time. The table of content for today, some housekeeping. Then we talk about free spice it takes about indie game budgeting rules. The main part of the talk is like a 10 step kind of like hierarchy where I would recommend to spend the money on. It's kind of your, your best return on investment. So you start with the first one, spend your money on that, and then once it's done, you move on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then we've got a summary in the end. Who is this talk for? It is for developers that make premium indie games for PC and console, like your classic five to $20 games. Um, it's not meant for you know, big investment companies that maybe publish quite a few games, that publish 30 games per year. They're gonna budget differently, or like bigger publishers their budget is more gonna be like allocated and to see what sticks and what works. This talk is more aimed at people that do old school game development, they make a game, they put some money in and they wanna get more money out. So it's like the goal being profitable. Um, and it's also not super aimed at people that make free to play games or mobile games, they work quite differently because you have to buy a lot more ads. Um, and also to bring it back to the analogy from the beginning, Often when I think about indie games, I think about them, they're quite similar to a restaurant or a kitchen, how they're run, especially, you know, the, the people that make the food, the food is your main ingredient. If the food isn't good, the restaurant's not gonna work. If your game isn't good, it's not gonna work. But there's a lot of stuff around it. Like you can have staff, you can have a nice ambient, you can have nice cutlery, you could have online bookings, you could have more parking space. There's a lot of stuff you could do to get an advantage there's also a lot of potential to overspend. And I think it's similar for indie games. There's so many things you, can, you could spend money on, but not all of them are gonna get you the best bang for your buck. And I think especially in indie games, if you're self-funded, you need to be super, super careful to not overspend and then don't have a return. And I think it's also the classic thing if you would see a restaurant or a nightclub that looks always busy and then suddenly goes bust. I think that same thing can happen to indie games. They look like it doesn't apply to like super hits that make millions, but like in the mid range where they're like, oh, they got like a few hundred reviews to look decent, but maybe if they spend like too much money, they're not super profitable still. So this talk is really aimed at people, you know, where you want to get the most out of your budget if you make a small indie game. Um, also, hard to include in a talk like that is like hidden dev costs. For example, if you make a demo to be in a Steam Fest, obviously that's kind of a marketing expense, but it's also development time. So those things are quite hard to quantify, so I would keep those in mind. Those will occur as well if you make the game yourself. A few words about me. My name is Thomas Reisenecker. I'm the co-founder of Future Friends Games. I did a count and I worked on around 10 million games, I think. Like, I've been in the industry for over 10 years. 
We do a couple of different things. We do publishing, which is published a game called Summer House. We work on Lysara, Exo One, Omno. We are also a self-publishing provider. Like we help with different services, with like press, with social media, um, with consulting. We make store pages. We work on stuff like Vampire Survivors or What the Goal. So we do also work on different indie games, which was kind of helpful for this talk. Like the data, the knowledge in this talk comes from my brain, like experience from the team, just working loads of games over the years. I also did an online survey where about 30 people provided extra data. And then big, big thank you to a lot of smart people that helped me out with more hot takes. Um, especially shout out to Derek Luke, Guillotine, Ico Partners, Player 2 PR, Pop Agenda, Raccoon Beast, Rocker Play, Shoe for Media, and yours truly. They were like super helpful with sharing data. So I get a broader picture of you know, what budgets look like. OK, let's dive in. Free indie game budgeting rules to live by that might get me into trouble. Let's start with number one. I think like taking a certain percentage and saying that's my total marketing budget, you know, that the budget is 100,000, 20% is your marketing budget. That can be like a rule of fun. You would often hear those ranges be being between 20 to 40. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. I get it as a big company, it can make sense to get some kind of idea. I think for a small company, you just need to see what you actually need and then don't spend more than that and don't spend less than that. And that's what we're doing today, like go through a checklist what you might want to spend your money on. I think planning your budget is great. I think sticking to it, terrible idea. There were so many instances over the years where we had a real win or made games successful because we were flexible, because we had a little bit of extra room to like take up opportunities. For example, that's a game we published called Exo One. Um, and that game was right in its promotion, main promotion cycle when TikTok for games started becoming a thing. So suddenly we shifted loads of resources to there because we got millions of views. And then we had to de delay the games a few times because of technical difficulties. And that randomly got us a Game Pass deal because suddenly there was a window open. So I think like being open as an indie and then being able to change your budget once you figure out what works is super important. Also, I feel like when people say, with enough marketing budget, every game can be successful, I think that's just not very true. I would always see marketing as a multiplier. And what I mean by that, I can show you here. Let's say you've got a highly marketed game that people really like, you announce it, and you know your following goes up, your wish lists go up, it's great. And then you put marketing muscle behind it, you do social media, you do press, all that kind of stuff, and it's a multiplier. And suddenly, you grow even faster. But then let's say, it's a bit more unlucky, you have a game that doesn't resonate so much with players, you're gonna announce it, it's gonna be a bit more flat, and then you put marketing money behind it, and obviously it's still a multiplier, but the curve is more this instead of this. So I would always keep that in mind, marketing can be really helpful, it's not gonna be like the saving grades if the game just doesn't resonate with players. Okay, let's get into the main bit, let's get into the budgeting hierarchy. So the idea is making a list of What's the best return of investment? Where do you get the best value for money? Um, start at the top, work your way down. There's two ways how you could do it. One, that's actually in real life how we see it mostly. People have a certain amount of marketing budget, and then they work their way down until they run out. Some, you know, sometimes you come to number three, sometimes you come to number eight. You might be a bigger company, and you run until 10 and beyond. And the other approach is if you start out and you don't know your budget yet, you know, take notes for each of one and see how much you would need, and that might give you an idea of how much money you should raise for your marketing. Top 10 points, let's go. Number one is first party support. What I mean by that, if you open your PlayStation, you go into the PlayStation store, you will see different games featured, and sometimes it's indie games, and that's great because there's a lot of PlayStations. Sometimes you can get social media support from first party, like Nintendo and Xbox and Steam. Or you'd see different Steam features, like being the popular upcoming list, getting a pop-up banner on Steam, those things are super valuable, and I can't overstate how valuable they are. This is different multipliers. It's not super scientific, but that's like roughly what reach different channels could get you. And you see on the very right, the first party, the stores, they've got a massive reach. And actually in real life, it's probably more like that. They have crazy reach. There's nothing else you can do to match that, which sounds great. Well, now we talk about how you get first party support, which is less great because it's not easy, because it is so good. There's a different approaches you could take. Number one, you could do it. That means you generate wish list, wish list, you try to get them. You talk to Sony, you talk to Nintendo, you email them when it's a game announcement, you ask if you can be in a showcase, if you can get social media support. You could also get an agent or a publisher to do that. They probably will take a ref share or a certain amount of payment. Or you could be lucky and just make a really good game and hope that works, and that sometimes works, but usually it doesn't, so I wouldn't recommend that. 
So the main thing here, this is a super hard one to put money on because it could be zero if you do it. It could be infinite if you know, your publisher takes most of the money and then you don't recoup. Um, I think the important thing is here, just do it. Make sure it's covered. If that's like the one thing you shouldn't ignore. Like don't do loads of tweets, but never like email Nintendo or something if you make a Switch game. Um, the second thing you should definitely do super high up the list is the Steam, the Steam store page or like any console store page. Even if you do nothing else, this is gonna get a massive amount of traffic. Um, and most people that will ever see your game, they will just find it in an online store. Again, that's why first party support is so important. What you're gonna need on your store page, let's go through that. You're gonna need a nice key art, capsule art that really communicates what your game is. Sometimes done in house, if you do it with a freelancer or an agency, it can cost between $500 and $5,000. Again, don't sue me if it costs less or more. If you wanna work with a specific expert, it will be more expensive or like a famous artist. If you go on Fiverr and pick the cheapest option, it will be cheaper. But obviously the quality will vary a lot. The second thing you're gonna need on the store page is a trailer. And that's a few clips from trailers and that should make clear how different trailers can be. You know, just gameplay, it could be animated, it could be a VR trailer where we actually see some like real actors. So there's a huge range what a trailer could cost. But they are super important. They're one of the main things that people look at in your store page and you're gonna need them for loads of other marketing stuff as well. Here's a few different prices what a trailer could cost. If you go super duper cheap, they can cost like 500 to 1,000 dollars. That usually means you do your own capture, you write your own script, you just bring it to someone who knows how to edit a video and they put it together for you. Often for indie games, we see like the second one, the second range, the simple trailer. It's often like in the three, four, five thousand dollar range where you will probably get some capture. They will help somewhat with the script. You probably work with them and get like a quite decent trailer. It goes up. If you go to an experienced trailer editor that makes like a more premium trailer, it can go into like a five to ten thousand dollar range. That means they will do more capture. They probably provide, you know, more marketing insights. They're going to help with the script. They're going to help you pitch the game. You can more hand it off to them. And if you go for a super fancy trailer, if you go with a pro where you just, you know, they give them the game and they just give you a great trailer back or a big agency, they can cost a lot more. It can cost 10 to 50,000, even more if there's actors involved or if mixed reality and stuff like that. So there's a huge range, but that should give you an idea what a trailer costs. How many trailers do you need? Usually one to three. For a small game, usually one. Bigger indie games often have an announcement trailer, a release date trailer, and a launch trailer, or in the middle, a gameplay trailer maybe. Um, some games that a lot of showcases are bigger, have five, six trailers, some even more. Obviously at some point it gets a bit of silly territory because you can't show that many different things about your game. What else you're gonna need on the store page is screenshots. Super important, but I don't know anyone who's just paid specifically for screenshots. So it's usually done in house or the trailer person helps you or your marketing person does it or you do it. You're gonna need a store description. Um, Again, this is something that's often done in-house by the writers. It's often done by the marketing team or yourself. If you wanted to get freelance help, prices vary a lot, but what we've heard a lot is like, you know, cheap, go on five, hundred dollars. Real experts that maybe do like a bigger branding, write you more stuff, it can cost a few thousand dollars to get this done nicely. We also gonna have tags and backend stuff on the Steam page, on the eShop and so on. Um, again, usually done in-house. A lot of people read really good newsletters, especially Game Discover Go and How to Market a Game are really, really great for that. Highly recommend it. Um, if you get an expert, sometimes, you know, they will just give you a little bit of feedback. Sometimes to write the whole thing, prices can vary from like the low hundreds to like a few thousand dollars if you want to get support with optimizing your store page. And the last thing on the store page that I would really recommend spending money on is localization. Super, super important. If your game's localized, localized store page as well. It can make a huge difference, especially in China. Prices can vary. If you go to AI, fan translation, Google, Brave, could cost nothing, could backfire a lot. If you go to a localization agency, you often see like prices with like six cents to 21 cents per word. Super depends on is do you have a lot of puns? Um, how many words do you have a game? What's your turnaround time? What languages do you need? But that's kind of the range. Uh, I would say like a bigger premium indie game often at these days aims for like eight to 10 languages. Again, big disclaimer, if you have got a narr massive narrative game, you maybe can't do that because it's gonna cost thousands and thousands per language. If you got a racing game where it's just, the word is press start and select car, you could probably do all the languages. The next thing I would spend money on is ongoing marketing planning support. Um, so now we've covered like the super basics, the first two points. Now we actually want to plan what we want to do actively to promote a game. 
And setting the right goals is super important. There's two things I would like avoid at all costs to miss. There's this event deadlines for online events we're gonna talk about in a minute. They can be a really great multiplayer and first party deadlines. If you miss them, you've just missed them. There's no going back. Those can be really expensive mistakes. And again, I would also recommend being flexible. There's a few ways how you could go about this. You could do your own marketing plan. You know, you read the newsletters, you talk to indies, you try to figure it out. You could hire a marketing person. You could also have an agency on a PR retainer, usually costs low thousands to like 10 thousands. Or you could do some consulting with an expert. This will usually depend how often you want to talk to them, how much input you need. It's again kind of one of those things where just make sure it's covered. Make sure you've got enough input so you know what's going on. Number four, attending online events. It's a really big trend at the moment. It's a great multiplayer. Like, I can't recommend this enough. We're talking about like Wholesome Direct, PC Gaming Show, The Mix, Indie World, the first party showcases. Being in those events is a huge reach boost. They often get a great Steam feature. They have good social media following. They will be on IGN, on GameSpot. They are really good value for money. Um, Simon Carlos did a really good list of like different tiers of what those events are and how much reach they get. And they also really vary in prices. So one thing they usually need is a new trailer. So you need a trailer that costs money. And there's different admission fees. It might be low hundreds, mid tiers often two to 10,000. If you go to a big one, it could go 50,000 to 300,000 to above that. The prices vary a lot depending on if your game's cool, if they want it to be in there, how long your video should be, or like your asset that you have in there. Um, and also at what time and what showcase you want to be in. I would say to all of that, they all have editorial slots as well. So if your game's really sick, you might get in for free. So it's definitely worth trying. I think it's also a really good indicator if you're like onto something. If you get into a PC gaming show for free, it means probably your game is pretty sick. If like you get in no showcase, even the small ones where you have to pay and you get in nowhere, that's probably an indicator that people don't really like resonate with that game. Um, how often do you be in events? I think how often you can. Um, most games that we work on where we like apply for loads of stuff, they will get like in three or four per year. If you get into more great, just, you know, at some point you maybe burn yourself out with not having enough new trailers or beats for those events. Next up is social media management. This is like the first thing on the list that has a way higher ceiling. Like, you know, you can only do one Steam page. There's only so many events. Social media, you could do one TikTok per month. You could do one per day. So there's a lot more you can do, a lot more leeway. Um, one mistake we see here a lot is people say, oh, we should just like hire someone like Victoria Tran. If you don't know, she works for Among Us, for like Innersloff. She's really good at all social media community management stuff. Please keep in mind, like, it's an umbrella term. There's a lot of stuff that people do in this field, you know, video creation, filming time in front of a camera, customer support. It's a quite complex field, and it's easy to take it for granted. Um, we looked at some numbers from the games industry career guide, how much salaries are in that range. Again, depends hugely. You would maybe look at thirty to $125,000, depending on where this person is based. If it's someone fresh off university on another continent, it might be less. If you have super senior, it might be more. Um, we also asked freelancers what their rates are at the moment. We got a lot of 20 to $100 per hour. Um, I would recommend you have, it could be yourself, it could be someone in the team or someone you hire. I would recommend for an indie game at least a part-time person for this, if you can, a full-time person, if not more. Organic influencer outreach. That means you send codes to influencers and they play your game and you don't pay them for it. There was like an online debate recently that people were like, oh, it's not working anymore. It used to be easier to get organic coverage. It's still super worthwhile, I think. It's not like it used to be that you get like loads of loads of tons of big videos, but that's absolutely potential to get free influencer coverage. Um, some things we worked on recently, you know, you still get your videos with hundreds or like 50,000 views and they can really move the needle. This can be a really big driver of wish list and visibility. How much it costs to get an organic influencer outreach depends a lot how big your game is, how much code management is evolved. Um, if you go with a freelancer, if you go with someone who covers this globally, different countries, I would say roughly two to $5,000 per outreach. Most indie games will have one to three outreaches, at least one at launch, maybe one for a Steam Fest, and then maybe one for like a preview or demo version. Organic press outreach means you send news and codes to press and you get coverage from them. We do hear a lot, hey, this doesn't have the impact it used to have. That is true, but I think it still has good impact. You see often wishlist increase from big sites. More importantly though, 
it's still like, you know, it shows up at Google. We worked on a game called Eye of the Temple. If you Google that game, you got like loads of great headlines. You know who Googles games? Influencers, people that manage the store page, other press people. So I think there's a lot of like secondary value that helps raising your profile from press outreach. Um, also, Metacritic store are still important on some online stores. A typical press outreach per beat would cost you 1000 to like maybe $5,000 in the indie sector. It can easily go up to 10 if it's localized in different languages, if your game's quite big and the code management is complicated or it's multi-platform, but that's roughly what you're looking at. I would say quantity, I would say at least three PR beats are great. One is the game announcement, one is the release date announcement, one is the launch. It can be more Steam first, preview, gameplay trailer, and so on. Again, three to five is usually what we're working with. Bigger games, six to seven. After that, it goes a bit into silly territory at some point, unless you know, make a really, really massive or an ongoing indie game. <laughs> if you made it until here, it's pretty sick. That's like most games that were like, nice, that's a good budget, like that's a good way to market an indie game. But obviously there's more money you can spend on if you have it. What you could do is attend events like GDC, what you need for that, you know, a ticket, accommodation, probably your travel. This will depend where you live and where you want to go. I would always say local events are great investment for networking, meeting platform holders, meeting publishers and all that. Going overseas depends. Sometimes I definitely wouldn't say you should go to all the big events like Gamescom, GDC, PAX every year for the sake of it. Like I think it's, it's an overspend, but if you pick carefully, I think that's a good investment. Paid influencer coverage, so paying people to make TikToks, YouTube videos, Twitch streams. This was like a super hard one to figure out. I talked to agencies, we do it themselves. Everybody was like, oh, it just really depends. So it really depends. I tried to figure out some things I can give you so it's a bit more tangible. I think it's a super easy way to overspend. It can be really good if you pick carefully. It can be a great return. So it's a very case-by-case -case basis stuff. Most games we work with, small indie games, don't pay for that or pay in the low hundreds. Bigger indie games, often you see like 15 to 50,000. Bigger games, this budget can go way up and can keep going. I got some help on this slide from a friend, MJ, from yours truly. They do a lot of influencer stuff. Um, I just wanted to figure out what's like a price range. And they're huge. Like I can tell you when we email people and say like, hey, I want a video, the price, the price range is it's wild west. It's all over the place. So it's a lot about comparing. If you're looking at a YouTuber for under 500K subs, you would maybe look at 600 to $12,000, huge range. You could look at another metric, which is cost per view. So you could look at how much does me a few cost. I think a pretty good range, if you manage like two to four cents, it's great. If it runs seven, still pretty good. If it goes beyond that, it would need to be a quite specific niche influencer, so it makes sense. For Twitch streamers, there's a similar big range. If you look at a two hour stream for a channel that has under 1 million subs, you maybe look at 600 to $6,000. If you look at really, really big Twitch channels, those numbers go like infinite, like it's crazy. You can spend a lot of money here. Um, we also have a cost per few range on Twitch. It's more that you aim for like a 13 cents. Paid social media ads, similar, quite difficult thing. It's not easy to measure. There's a lot of games we worked on tried to do that and then didn't have a good return. If you figured out how to you know, get a TikTok, Instagram ad and they get money back from it, great. Some people can do it. This also works surprisingly better on crowdfunding than on released games. A lot of games we work with don't spend money on this or like in the low hundreds. A lot of experts I talk to, it really helps if you have $500 to $1,000 per channel to optimize it so it gets a lot cheaper. So it's better not to spread too thin but you know, focus on a few channels but figure them out well. And like once you know it's running and you make money back per advert, obviously these budgets are quite of infinite and keep going until they don't work anymore. Also interesting, a few people buy adverts to get more wish lists, to get a better Steam ranking. They would often look at one, two dollars per wish list if they buy ads. Again, talk to people that have half of that, talk to people that pay double, depends on your game, depends on the country, but it's a rough guideline. Some closing thoughts. Some of those things I talked about are easier to outsource. Some of them are harder to outsource. For example, social media, you can work with an agency. We do that, but it's often something that's good if it's kept in-house, you're quite close to it because you will be involved in development and a lot of it happens that's interesting in social media. Press and influence outreach are super easy to give away. Those agencies, they have the contacts, you explain in the game, they send it out. So there's different things that are easy and hard to outsource. Everything in the middle, first party supports to a page, a marketing planner, I would like probably keep in house, but maybe get professional advice if you can. 
What about the other stuff? Physical press kits, super animated trailers, making of videos. Why are they not on there? Because I think for me at the moment, they just don't have that good return of investment. That being said, we've done all this stuff on different games and it did work. It's just not on my default list. So I would take those, you know, not super high up the list, but it can work if your game's right for it. Other regions, this is very focused on the US and Europe. If you want to specifically market in Asia, I think finding a local partner super helps. It's quite common that you don't take payment, but a revenue share. So in that sense, you know, you're not spending money, but you get less revenue from that. In the end, we've got a summary of our checklist what to spend money on. Obviously, it's a tier list because video games. Number one, um, Steam store page, console store page, most important thing, and first party support. Talk to the platform holders, see if you can get featuring. After that, I would make sure you've got a good marketing plan, a good marketing planner to set the right goals of where you're going. Afterwards, I would invest in digital showcases and social media and community management, followed by organic press and influence outreach. Then I would say attending event, and then see if you've got money left for paid influencers, paid ads. And at very last is the rest that could make sense if there's budget less. In the F tier, I didn't have one, but that's what the chart looks like, so it's also the rest. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, again, thanks so much for coming while well, Zelda is on. And like, if you've got questions, I think you've got a little bit of time, so you could just come up to the mic and ask. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. That was great. Wanted to ask you specifically about Reddit. Have you had experience with that as, as a platform? If you can expand on that, that would be great. Okay, specifically Reddit. Um, specifically, yeah. I would say on an organic level, there's usually two ways how we tackle Reddit. One is if somebody in your team loves Reddit and they're really good on it, they're actually part of the community. It can be super strong, but they know the rules and it's quite complicated. And then there's like Reddit Lite, which I would recommend every indie game um, to go into nice subreddits, like indie gaming subreddits, made in Unity subreddits. They're a lot more chill and self-promotion. They're not as big, but it's still pretty good value for money. And then paid Reddit ads can, I've heard, work quite well depending on the genre. Like strategy games and stuff, like more hardcore gamer things, can work well on Reddit. Thank you. Hi. This might be a little eccentric of a question. I was just curious. So these are all, a lot of the stuff you're talking about makes sense within the ecosystem of gaming itself. I wondered if you had any experiences in all of these experiences that you had, like in other cultural realms or like oddball strategies you had tried that had worked or not worked, just I was curious about that yeah. idea. I, I think it's something we get a lot when somebody makes a racing game, they're like, oh, can we be in a racing, on a racing website, on a car website, or like, can we have a crazy guerrilla marketing stunt? And I would usually say those things are great once you've done the top 10. Mm. I think like this is the easier one to get. It's a lot harder to convince someone who doesn't play Steam games but likes cars to buy a PC, download Steam, sign up, download a game, get a controller. There's a lot of steps to convince people. So I think it can make sense as a secondary thing, but I would focus on games first. Of course. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, amazing talk. Uh, also, big fan of your talk from last year. Uh, no one cares about your video game. I watch that all the time. But um, yeah, specific question. In terms of social media channels and what has the biggest ROI for ad spend, I guess I'm curious, because you know, I, I, I do like the Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, Trifecta. I'm not sure really where my money is best spent. I'm, and I'm sure that's game dependent, but you know, rough rule of thumb if you had some. Yeah, I would say like I'm not the super expert on paid ads. Um, from what we've tried and people we've talked to, I feel at the moment Reddit, TikTok, and then Meta, so Facebook and Instagram work quite well. Okay. I've, like stuff like Instagram Stories, I think have quite a good return. We do had we do had did have some good success on TikTok but mostly for games where we've made loads of posts. So we've already made 50 posts. We know those two went trending, so we boost them. You know, you beat the test the post first, right. but that takes a lot of upfront investment to figure out what's a good TikTok for you. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So figure out what works and then kind of double down on that. Yes, I think it helps a lot. It's like, you know, social media is ruthless, but it's really good, it's really good testing because people only make posts big and they interact with them if it's interesting to them. Right. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. 
So you mentioned this talk was for um, you know PC games, console games, and not for mobile games, but what about those of us who are creating a VR game? Is there any difference in spend, anything else you would add or change um, for a VR game? Yes, we do work on a lot of VR games. I feel like they are in a quite similar category. A few things that are different is like there is less press. I think it's still relevant, but there's only two or three big websites, so you'll probably go lighter on the spend there. Um, other than that, social media is, quite, is a little bit different in that Reddit is a lot more excited about VR games than other games, so I think Reddit is more important. Also, TikTok works surprisingly well. Um, other than that, campaigns can be shorter because wish lists and all that momentum doesn't matter so much, so it can be like, you know, two, three month campaigns are more common in VR. Um, but a lot of it is quite similar in terms of like organic outreach for press and influencers, the marketing plan. So I think like it almost applies. It's pretty close. I think mobile is quite removed from what we talked about. VR is pretty close to that. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering sort of a meta question. How do you measure whether, you know, some form of marketing is actually performing better than others? Are there certain very direct metrics you can actually? Measure? Yeah, I feel like we get this question asked a lot, what's our KPIs? And usually our KPIs number goes up. I know it sounds simple, but I think it's really helpful. You would see your social media following growing. You would suddenly see wish lists increasing. You see pre-orders going up. So just really keeping like an eye on those really quite basic numbers is quite good. Got it. Is there a way to tie that directly with uh, installs or um, There's people, or engagement? they do like, you know, link tracking with UTM links. Um, it, it can give you an idea. It's not always super reliable. Like if you got a tracking link on TikTok, a lot of people see a game on TikTok and then they go to the PC and wish list. So that didn't work, like that tracking thing. Um, I feel like for us, it's a lot based on just like working in a lot of games and getting a gut feeling. You know, we do something, but nothing else happens. And then we see how the numbers go up, but they don't. So I think this is what the talk is mostly based on. It's, it's quite hard to track. I think tracking links is probably the closest you would get. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Do you have a point of view on um, social media accounts being um, developer owned or individual to each game? Um, it really depends if you want to make more games in the same niche. I think if you stay like in narrative games, in racing games, definitely like I would make a studio account instead of a game account. What we also do quite a lot is just like rebrand them as we go. You know, we would have the studio name on Twitter slash the game name. And then when this next game, we just exchange that and update the accounts. Um, generally, the more personal your accounts can be, the better if you have a small game, especially on Reddit. Um, but it really depends on a case by case basis. Cool. Well, I think time's up. Thank you very much. <laughs>